hello everyone. Welcome to the board meeting uh, this uh, July of Ebbs Fleet Development Corporation on a what is a very hot day. Um, why don't we just start with, um, do we have any apologies uh, for absence? Yes, for me and Piper today and Louise Hardy. Okay, all right. Um, so that's um, any declarations of interest. I think we'll probably have uh, one from Neil and one from uh, Daniel, Lord Moylan. Neil, please. Thank you, Simon. Um, as you know, and others know, I'm a member of the Ebbs Fleet Development Corporation Planning Committee. And as a result, I will not participate in any discussion or decisions in promoting or assisting in the promotion of applications made by the corporation for planning permission. And any observations I make today should not be taken as an indication as to how I might vote when considering any planning application. And I will consider any planning application at the appropriate time on its merits after consideration of the application documents, representations, officer's report and other relevant material. And that is a declaration that I make as a member of the planning committee. Thank you very much for that, Neil. Uh, Daniel? Uh, I'm a member of the Ebbsfleet Development Corporation's planning committee. If at a meeting of the board of the corporation or, one, or of one of its committees, I participate in any discussion or decision promoting or assisting in the promotion of applications made by EDC for planning permission, I shall recuse myself from participation in consideration or determination of that matter at any meeting of the planning committee. Any observation I make today should not be taken as an indication as to how I might vote when considering any planning application. I will consider any planning application at the appropriate time after consideration of the application documents, representations, officer's report and other relevant material. Thank you for that, Daniel. And I think probably as a matter of good order, both yourself and I should declare that we are directors of Ebbsley Garden City Trust and you indeed are the chairman of that. Um, so uh, those are non-remunerated uh, positions that we have there. That should be, I think, just I so standard, standard declaration, I think, for both of us. Yes. All right, um, thank you for that, everyone. That then brings us on to the minutes of our board meeting on the 16th of June, 2021. Those are in front of us. I think they are a full and uh, accurate record of the meeting. Are there any comments on those? Uh, John, can I bring you in? Uh, yes, please. Um, I note in the uh, commentary, obviously, we're still waiting the appointment of the uh, Kent County Council representation to the EDC board. I can also point out we are still waiting um, what's been named for quite some time, the planning member for the committee uh, from Gratian Borough Council to be formally appointed by government is still out wait, still wait, waiting on the letter. It's still being promised, but still nothing's come through. Um, becoming ridiculous, really. Yes, John, look, just to comment on that, I discussed that with the MHCLG uh, team yesterday, and they are, you know, uh, attempting to move things forward uh, within the department, but um, people are aware that that needs addressing. So, uh, you know, as soon as we can get a response there, um, we will uh, we will be grateful to receive it. But the point is well made, John. So I'm going to uh, assume that the minutes are duly uh, duly agreed. Uh, then we have actions, uh, board action log there. I think we are now that we are in stage four of uh, of the timetable. We are looking to actually to get together as a board for a site uh, tour on the 31st of August, which is, you know, I think we'll all be looking forward to that. And indeed, uh, later on this July, uh, with um, with representatives from our local uh, sort of uh, CCG. Uh, we have a, a tour around uh, the Garden City in respect of our, you know, our health uh, quarter investment as part of Ebbs Fleet Central. So that's later on this month. Otherwise, I think we are satisfactorily actioning and progressing all of those, um, all of those elements. Uh, then we have our forward plan that we can see, our forward look, uh, what we're, 
you know, what we're working on. Um, we're hoping that we can sit together as a group on the 15th of September in Ebbsfleet for our first board meeting uh, following uh, following lockdown. Uh, so um, looking forward to that. Uh, so anyway, um, that uh, I suggest then moves us on to our first piece of business today. Um, as we have discussed, our chief executive Ian Piper is taking some very well deserved uh, leave. So Gerard, I think you are going to take forward um, the chief executive's report to the board. Yep. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you say, Ian's on leave, so it's fallen to me. As you'll see in front of you with the paper, um, the office has reopened this week in line with government guidance. Uh, the government guidance was received sort of late last week, so we've had to make a little bit of tweaks and adjustments to the um, staffing plan. Uh, the guidance does state that it's important for employers to mitigate against the risk of the virus spreading. And the example they give of a mitigation is to use fixed teams or fixed cohorts of staff. So that's what we're starting to do in our sort of phased return. Um, so that's a little bit of a change to, to what we were anticipating. We've, we've got most of the um, the uh, assumptions correct. We've reduced the capacity within the observatory. We've sort of co confined the layout of the use of desks. Um, I was in my team were in the office yesterday and uh, it all, all, all seems to be going very well. So far, so good. Um, so that's nice to be back in the office and actually seeing people face to face. Um, you've got two annexes attached to the paper, the quarter one performance report, and hopefully board will notice that an awful lot has happened in quarter one and things are progressing very well. And you've also got the Annex B, the staff survey action plan, where we've got some actions to respond to the recent staff survey that was carried out. So I don't know if, if board have any questions they'd like, like an attempt to answer or look to others to help out. Thank you for that, uh, Gerard. Um, David, can I bring you in, please? Yeah, thanks, Gerard. And I, I think what's striking about the success of the first quarter KPIs is, is just the level of achievement that, that we've made um, in a short period against the number of the criteria there. And I'm just wondering, and I can't recall whether we set ourselves some stretch targets or whether we should be setting ourselves some stretch targets as a board now that we've seen the outcome from the first quarter, because we patently went into this this KPI round with uncertainty around where we were in the pandemic, um, what the state of the economy would be. Uh, and I know it's still uncertain, but I'm just wondering how, as an executive team, you are applying some stretch targets or whether you're applying some stretch targets on the back of the first quarter's results and potentially the second quarter. Yeah, I, as you say, quarter one has been very, very good. Um, there, as you mentioned, there is an awful, an awful lot of uncertainty still around, um, particularly as I think we've, has been mentioned previously, you know, we're around um, the scarcity of some materials and the challenges that um, inflation and sort of price increases are causing. So we all, we consider that the sort of particularly the housing target, um, whilst you know we're, we're confident that will be achieved, there are some challenges ahead for for the industry and the economy, which at, with at the right. moment is progressing well, but there are there are some you know a significant amount of uncertainty ahead. Uh, okay, I, I I I mean I suppose my question, Simon, is a broader one about whether we as a board believe we need to have just a sort of a relook at this at some stage over sort of perhaps after the summer just to determine whether or not there's anything else we want to add to it from an internal target perspective as opposed to our key um, external KPIs. No, it, it's it's a good point David you know I certainly think and I hope people agree that we should have another look at this perhaps when we've got two uh, two quarters of data behind us see where we are you know, I think it's, you know, it is good as well that we have yeah. got strong performance when we're going into, you know, a spending review submission for uh, the Garden City as well, that we can evidence strong performance and momentum. Uh, with sure. And it's uh, so, not to detract from the performance of quarter one. I just think that it, it's raised a question in my mind as to whether we we need to relook at it, perhaps at the half year. Yeah, I, th I think we should we should take okay. a temperature read out okay. to right. half. Thank you. Nick, can I bring you in, please? Uh, a very minor point, I, um, <clears throat> and Gerard, you may need to pass this on, but I'm interested in how the 
ITT um, stage process is going on North Fleet Riverside, whether you're seeing um, the level of activity that you'd expect in terms of the uh, returns um, or whether um, uh, the market is a, a little uh, still a little hesitant. Or whether it's simply too early to tell. Julia, would you like to comment on that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so we had um, a reasonable response um, from the developers. Um, so obviously we went down to a shortlist and we're expecting the returns from that shortlist. Um, from the initial expression of interest, as I recall, I think we had to not continue um, to, to the next stage from the initial expression of interest um, from, from there. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, perhaps just to say, look, I think it has been a strong start in our performance Q1 summary. You know, as part of that, I'd like to place on record thanks to the team and our professional advisors around our submission to Natural England uh, in respect to the triple SI uh, designation for land under our ownership in uh, Ebbsfleet Central. Uh, we did object to that in strong terms based upon the evidence base that we have reviewed. Um, you know, independently, London Resort and their advisors themselves uh, have as well uh, objected to land within you know, their proposed development, uh, development area. Those are separate submissions. Um, so we will await uh, the further thoughts of Natural England later on this year. But that's a substantive and important piece of work that has been completed. Uh, so you know, that's something which is a standout performance, I think, for me during the, during the first quarter of the year. And I, I'm also encouraged to see you know, the, the staff survey action plan, uh, which, uh, which is attached to this as well, this paper. You know, I certainly know from the perspective of uh, Ministry of Housing Communities, local government, they picked up, you know, observations around engagement and visibility of the team there. And they have stressed to me that, you know, they really are available at our request uh to you know participate in board meetings and to be highly visible and interactive with the board uh, so i thought that was a very positive reaction um from them uh then clearly an incredibly important stakeholder of the development corporation so um are there any other uh, comments on this i think it is to be noted this paper um one quick question uh gerard um how do we disseminate into the public domain our quarterly performance statistics and our KPI performance statistics? Is that is that something that that we do or should be disseminating via our various website and social media platforms? Well, it, this paper is obviously in the public part of the meeting. The annual um, quarterly, uh, the annual performance goes in the annual report and accounts. Um, we can put the information on the website, which will be part of the normal board papers pack. But we can, we can, if you'd like some more, we can, can obviously do that as well. Um, yeah, I think it would be good if we could disseminate our quarterly performance statistics so people can see them, you know, clearly. Let's be transparent and visible here. Also, we have a strong story, so let's. We have a strong story. Never be, uh, never be as uh, shy about sharing it with as many people as you can. So, you know, perhaps uh, you and Cons can. Uh, can work on the way that we can disseminate this so people can see the work that's going on uh, and the momentum that the Development Corporation in Garden City has. So uh, I'm sure the board will share that um, that, um, sure. that view. Um, so, 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 yes, so, David. Yes, the, I suppose the only the only observation I, I'd make, Simon, when, when we talk about a strong performance is that quite often in the first quarter of a year, one isn't showing a strong performance that it takes to the half year to get underway, particularly with the way in which money is allocated these days. Um, and therefore, do we want to put up quarterly results or do we want to put up half yearly results? Um, because once you start doing something, of course, you've got to continue it. Um, that's my experience as producing annual accounts for listed companies. So so all I would say is not not wishing to hide information from the public, but what might be relevant information and useful information at the end of the first quarter 
as opposed to half yearly. And that, that, that's the only observation I'd make on this. We happen to have had a strong performance this year. I'm not sure that we've had that first quarter strong performance in previous years, that it's been slightly more evenly spread across the year. Yes, I, I think your swings and roundabouts. I, I, I definitely feel there is a feeling that uh, the Development Corporation has been shy in telling people what it's achieved. Yeah. Um, so when I talk to various stakeholders, um, you know, I, I think we can do a better job at getting our story out. Sure. No, no, no. That's fine. I, 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 I just thought I'd add that from my own personal experience um, from listed company reporting. That's all. Right. But thank you. Thank you very much, David. Right. Nick. So just following the, 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 that theme, um, the, um, there's a new story here and it needs comms and um, and not just merely a extract from a board paper. Um, and we should uh, we should sell it. Just so. So uh, I know uh, Mark will be on the, on the call, so perhaps he can think about the most effective way that we can create maximum um, impact to our various stakeholders and those who are watching us as we go into a spending review. Um, good. Thank you very much for that. So the paper is duly noted. Thank you for contributions there, which then brings us on to Ebb's Fleet at Living in July. Kevin. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll, I'll take the, the paper as, as, as read, but I'll just pull out a couple of highlights from the, the past activity in the Garden City over this month. Obviously, with restrictions lifting on Monday, it's a really good sign for the Garden City as we can start planning for events to come forward. And we're pleased to say that we are going to have a, a citywide event on the 14th of August um, for all the residents of the Garden City uh, in Castle Hill Park. So we're working with our community board members at the minute to design that park and for the residents who want to input, sorry, the event in the park and for the residents who are interested in joining and contributing to that, we're very open uh, for suggestions, but we're working very hard with um, residents to try and have a, an opening up of the Garden City event on the 14th of August. Um, just another point to, to commend um, is the the Health and Wellbeing Festival, which concluded on Saturday with a festival in Ebbsfleet um, Castle Hill Park and the, the Village Green. Um, we had just over 750 residents attended the event. Uh, over 250 people attended workshops at the event as well, which actually makes it the largest event we've ever held for the community in the Garden City. So really commended to, to the Grand and Grizz End who, who've done that event. Um, first for, for complying with COVID restrictions, still going ahead with the event, but also making it one of the most successful we've had in the Garden City. Uh, and their, their point was very much to try and engage people with their place. And many of the residents we met at the event on Saturday were the, the first time they've actually met neighbours, first time they've actually been out in the Garden City. So it was really encouraging to see that and a real thanks to the Grand Degrees and for all their work in delivering that festival. And the final point I just wanted to make today was our, our colleagues at Darren Valley Health Trust, who again worked with us over the last month to do a number of events to, to mark the 73rd anniversary of the NHS's birthday and also for us to kind of raise some money for the local charity for, for staff and patients. And again, I was very successful with both ADC staff running events, local residents running events, and our Better Points app also making contributions for that. So people who have generated um, points during the last year have contributed those and, do and donated them to the, to the Health Trust, which well, was really great. I'm happy to take any questions on the rest of the paper. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, board, are there any comments, observations, questions? Yes, Bob, please. It's just a very short comment, really, to uh, say how pleasing it is to see this report, because um, it gets better each, and it's been a very difficult period, obviously, and it's obviously going to get a lot better as we can all start mixing again. But uh, if you look at the history of the corporation, when we obviously started with virtually nothing, and now look at this report with all the work going on with the new schools, um, I was particularly impressed with the Minecraft uh, initiative at Cherry Orchard. Um, it, there's some really good initiatives in here and it's very, very pleasing seeing this level of community activity coming from the community. Um, so uh, just carry on the good work. Thank you. Well said, Bob. Uh, Nick, can I bring you in, please? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, likewise, I agree. Um, Kevin, I'm really interested in um, how you're benchmarking Ebsleet against um, your peers. I mean, obviously, we're, we're looking at both um, 
what's happening in existing communities and how we're working with both DARPA and Gratian to make sure we're very much integral to those communities. Uh, the Health and Wellbeing Festival was also run on Saturday in Northfleet, so it wasn't just for the Garden City. We are sort of working with existing communities as well. We do look, however, at other places like ourselves. We are looking at places like Thames Meeting, King's Cross and Royal Docks in terms of new places and what they're doing in terms of generating uh, approaches. Um, you know, saw, for example, our cultural strategy last month was very much bespoke to us and very much from the ground up, but also trying to develop capacity locally. So we are taking different approaches than in other places. We're learning from the other places, but ours is, you know, is very much a, a community driven one, but also bringing in sort of national um, other offers. So we're not just just doing the community as, as we sort of discussed last month. So so we are looking at those other places. We are looking at their approach. All of them have very different approaches. All of them have very different budgets. Some are spending uh, many millions a year on community development. Um, you know, I think I think we've made, as, as Bob said, quite a lot of progress, but, you know, we're not at that level but that doesn't mean we're not doing as much for the community so we are looking at other places we're learning how they're doing it um but very much making ours bespoke to our place but in terms of evaluation if that's what you're thinking Nick, no, we, ha we haven't got an evaluative approach to it okay which may, which may come from the subsequent paper on social mores yeah we, we did do an evaluation actually as part of our healthy new time so canterbury christchurch university did try and monitor our community activity but it does take a very longitudinal approach. I think you need to be doing that for five to 10 years. It's very hard for us to say within six months or a year what effect we've had in community building. It is a long-term approach. So you're right, when we come to the outcomes framework, I think that's probably where we're looking at this from. Thank you. Great, but Kevin, thank you very much. I think your paper is for noting. We picked up on a couple of points. Please carry on all the good work. So that is duly noted. That then brings us on to the next paper, which is again in your name. Ebbsfleet Garden City Social Value Framework. Please talk us through this. Yeah, I'm joined with my colleague Paul Bajan, who's been working with me on, on this project. Uh, you may not have met, met Paul before, but he should be on screen here somewhere. Uh, and he will be answering some questions as, as well for you. Um, again, we'll take the paper as read, but just to, to say what it is, it's, a, it's effectively an approached, a proposed approach to collate, quantify, and measure the social value that we believe we're achieving in the Garden City over time and, and, and widening that to make sure we're looking at socio-economic and environmental benefits to local residents. This is very much building on our agreed inclusive growth approach to try and make sure that the investment both by ourselves and by our partners and by contractors and others in the Garden City um, is benefiting local people and that we, we are able to quantify that over time. So the approach that's put in the paper is something we'd like the board to endorse including using the social value portal which will be a framework which will not only measure the impact that we as an organization are having in our investment but also what's been achieved through other contractors and other projects in the local area and the third thing we're asking you to approve today was the setting up of a partnerships fund uh, the partnerships fund is to allow other organizations who, who who might not have as comprehensive an approach to social value to be able to contribute to uh, a pot where we can kind of take a, a coordinated approach from large, from smaller projects to deliver well-being and benefit to the Garden City area. So happy to take any questions on the paper. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, Neil, can I bring you in, please? Thank you, Simon. Um, Kevin, I just had a question on your section 3.4. At 3.4.1, it says the framework will add value to the process when EDC is engaging with Garden City developers and so on. And then there's another reference at 3.4.4. Um, I've seen guidance on how the social value model might be used for evaluating contracts, but how do you envisage the framework will add value to the process uh, when dealing with planning applications? So, so we've been working closely with um, Mark and his team in planning to see what would be helpful to them in the planning process. So what we're trying to do through the framework and using the TOMS is that we have a consistent way of talking about social value, that we've got a consistent way of monitoring and measuring social value, so that we have a consistent way of having a dialogue with developers and contractors. So in the past, 
we find that a lot of the contractors and developers are really interested in doing social value. It's something that's integral to all of their organizations, but often they don't know how to do it in the place or in our place or don't have the resources to do that. So we see the social value approach that we're proposing to have a consistent dialogue for us to be able to prioritize what areas in socioeconomic and environmental areas that local people would prioritize and for us then to be able to discuss with developers in that process what we think they could do to contribute to this social value. So it's it's more a dialogue tool than a requirement. It's it's not there to be the stick, but more the kind of carrot that we can work positively with them. Thank you. Follow that up for a moment, Chair. Um, yes, so would that be at the pre-application stage? Because it seems to me difficult to use that as a test that you apply when you're determining whether to grant planning permission, unless you incorporate it in the planning policies. Yeah, so so it's not it's not seen as that at all. It's It's been seen as something that when we're working with developers on the ground as they're delivering, we have this dialogue, we know what our priorities are. So it's, as I said, it, it's, it's meant to be a carrot that we're working positively with them and engaging with them rather than it being the stick, which as you said, would need to be something that comes through policy, which this isn't trying to be. Thank you. Right, um, we have a uh, David, can I bring you in? Then we have got uh, Daniel. Yeah, and I, I, yeah, and I, I think Neil may well have sort of got the answer I was after here. So so this isn't about necessarily something that would have changed historical outcomes or might change some of the key outcomes. It's it's about how we extract greater value in our relationship with some of our stakeholders. Is that right, Kevin? Or is it about being able to demonstrate that we are extracting greater value? I, I suppose I'm just trying to gauge whether there is a lot more we can achieve by doing this or whether this just acts as a measure to demonstrate that we're doing it. I think both actually, David. So so the fact that we have a measure and that we can be consistent about, about what it is we're prioritising, we believe we can actually generate more in doing that. We believe a lot of our partners, developers, contractors want to do more in the area. It's just sometimes they hadn't had the resource. So having this tool will help them actually contribute more positively. Um, in the paper, we set out sort of five different areas that we think we can contribute through. So there is EDC investment, EDC procurement. There's also our planning discussion. So we're looking at the sort of five areas that we would like to get involved in. Um, Paul's been doing a lot of discussions with developers and contractors on the ground. Do you want to just say a little bit more about that, Paul? So, so, so yeah, yeah, but just a minute, Kevin, can I just, well, I suppose what I'm trying to check is it's a bit like Neil's question about, do we believe this might change the outcome or decisions we might make around procurement or who we're procuring from um or do we think this is more about extracting more from them um uh, so 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 if say you have applied this historically which i know you can't do you think it might have changed some of the decisions we might have made through our tendering process or through our uh, i mean planning you've you've answered i'm just looking for the broader broader aspect here as to whether we think it might have changed some of our decisions we've made in the past as to who we would work with and who we yeah. wouldn't. I think I think um, Julia wants to come in on that because we've been working very hard with Julia and her project team in, in terms of how we can affect procurement. So uh, as I say, we're, we're looking across all the different ways we can influence. So we do believe overall we will make a better impact to outcomes overall. But if Julia just picks up the procurement one specifically. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so on the procurement one, um, there's two ways of looking. So up until now, we specifically haven't been asking um, a social value question in, in the procurements. However, when we looked at the overall way in which we have contracted to deliver some area aspects on the ground, the very strong social value and circular economy inputs have been one of the factors that we've taken into account when deciding what route to actually deliver. So I would say that that's in place. I think the important thing to remember is that um, multiple uh, companies, whether they be developers or contractors, all have very strong social value programmes. Um, and, and part of that is because of the way in which they're being assessed. So, for example, BlackRock and people who are doing the assessment and uh, ranking of them, um, social and environmental um, 
kind of criteria is being looked at now and therefore in order to make social value work the most primary important if you're a developer or a contractor is you go into that area and understand what the need is first and what Kevin and the team have done is identified the need to then help whether it's the developer or the contractor I hope that helps And I Thank think there's one final point on that, David, is just that we've had, added some granularity to that as well. So, for example, local employment is something that everyone uses as a, as a measure, but we've added in a much more granular five, five mile first approach. So whereas contractors may have used the 20 mile or 40 mile as being local, we, we recognise that as well. But we are also introducing some granularity as to five miles first to give us a better impression of, you know, the impact we're having very, very locally. Excellent, thank you for that. Daniel, can I bring you in and then Nick? Well, um, I'm rather sceptical about this, I have to say. Um, I'm willing to go along with it because the sum involved is £18,000, including that. And it's in, it's in, it's, um, uh, it's in the existing budget. Um, so I'm not going to be opposed to it today. But I do think we need to be looking very carefully at the, the outcomes. And in a year's time, we need to have proper review as to whether this is actually giving us information that is of any use. If there is, in fact, a consistent way of measuring what's called social value, um, if the uh, criteria are driving us in strange and unusual directions that we might not otherwise be following. So I'll go along with it for today, but I do think it needs a review before we come, because this is a one year exercise, isn't it, Kevin? We're proposing to start it this year. The cost we've said is per annum. Um, yes. We'd probably look at um, doing a contract with them for one year extendable beyond that. But as you say, um, Daniel, to kind of review it um, annually to see how the, this particular model that we're using and this tool that we're using is the best suited for it. Well, I, I think we should be looking at a, a review at board, um, say, whatever you advise, but maybe two months before the extension date uh, 12 months down the road, see what I mean. Daniel, that, that seems extremely sensible, so I think that should be built into our decision here. Nick, can I bring you in? Yes, um, thank you. Uh, so, uh, interesting paper, thank you, Kevin. Um, <clears throat> I went to look at to, uh, at uh, Social Value Portal and to actually see who their um, main clients were and uh, interestingly, there, there is Dudley regeneration, but everybody else on their clients are actually contractors um, or developers, uh, which actually you know, gives uh, credence to what Kevin was saying, namely that you know, they all have good, strong social value um, approaches and they want to score uh, points in this uh, regard. Um, I think that this could help us in our procurement process. Um, I don't think it's necessarily something which is going to uh, improve planning cases or deliver planning um, uh, arguments or outcomes. But as a garden city, actually, we need to have a focus and, as Kevin said, a pool for where social value contributions from our uh, procurement partners uh, can deliver value in the long term or in the short term for Epsic Garden City. So I think it's a I think it's a good a good concept and you know, a good and a, and a good uh, paper. Um, but otherwise, I agree with absolutely everything that people have said already on, in the context of this. Um, and particularly that Daniel, it is a small amount of money um, and uh, we can review in a, in a year's time to see how it's going. But I think it's a great concept. I, I should have said if we're going ahead, I support the partnership fund. I think that is a, a sensible adjunct to it. All right, we've had a good discussion there. We have three recommendations in front of us. Um, can I assume that's, um, that's agreed by everyone? Excellent, thank you very much for that. That then brings us on to uh, Kevin, uh, yourself and uh, Miriam. I don't know if Miriam is joining us uh, in respect of our outcomes framework. Hello there, Miriam. Thank you, Miriam. Um, so the outcomes framework um, sits very comfortably as part of the package with, with the social value work uh, and very much comes back to Nick's point from earlier is how, how we monitor our impact in the place over time. 
So when we were established um, in 2016, we did a baseline study um, to look at the quality of life of the local area so we could see how that was changing over time. And we had a resident satisfaction survey to see how residents felt about the place over time. That included resident satisfaction survey in the adjacent communities as well as the new community. Um, when the tailored review was taking tailored review, uh, sorry, and that meant that in our first series of KPIs, we included quality of life as one of our key indicators. Um, on the tailored review in 2017, they they recommended that we didn't have KPIs that were um, difficult for us to directly influence, including quality of life. So we rationalised our our indicators to be ones that we have direct control over. However, we did recognise as a board at that time that we would still like to monitor the impact of investment and development over time and how that affected the overall area in terms of quality of life and how res residents were satisfied with that. So we set about trying to develop a new framework that would enable us to monitor influence um, over time. That's what we're currently calling the outcomes framework. Um, the framework as proposed has tried to combine both the objective data and the subjective data. So that's the, the objective data, which we had in our previous quality of life wheel with the subjective data from the resident satisfaction survey. So in forming this outcomes framework, we've had a, a fresh resident satisfaction survey. We've also had a, a business survey with a limited number of businesses that we have locally. And we've also had a fresh look at the outcomes, which are um, factual um, that were available to us to look at as well. Um, so the outcomes framework as proposed, it gives us a snapshot of what life is like for people in the garden city at a point in time and allow us to, to monitor that as it changes over a time frame. Um, the propositions within your, your, your slide pack, uh, we're happy to take questions on this as a proposal. John, can I bring you in please? Thank you very much. Um, I noticed um, I picked up on what you said there Kevin about doing the satisfaction survey of the neighbouring neighbourhood outside of the EDC area. Can you give me some details please as to who and what and how you undertook that survey? Um, because I'm not particularly aware of it in my, I'm in the neighbouring neighbourhood and I'm not aware of what you did on that front. So I'd be interested to know how you achieved that please. Yeah, so um, from the original baseline survey in 2016, most of the data that's available to us comes at ward level. So we've 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 used the wards of Northfleet North, Northfleet South, um, Swanswick and Greenhide, and now the new Ebbsfleet ward. So those are the four wards that we that we cover in terms of the data that's collected. And the resident satisfaction survey was open to people in those areas. So we had a leaflet to all 10,000 properties in those uh, wards, which includes Ebbsfleet Garden City and the surrounding wards. Um, and the resident satisfaction survey has a proportional amount of um, responses from each of the wards and the new Garden City area to make sure that we've got a balanced approach. So if you sent out 10,000 leaflets, I'd be interested to know how many got returned. Yeah, um, well, it, it, was an on, it was an online survey. Um, we had 400 responses to it. Um, which is below what we would have hoped. However, in previous years, we were able to do door to door and phone calling. And obviously, as this was carried out during COVID, we weren't allowed to do any door to door knocking and any phone calling. And we um, obviously had a, a lower number of responses due to that. Sorry, if I might come back. I think 400 responses out of 10,000 isn't particularly representative. Uh, online surveys aren't very effective in that area. I can tell you that now. Um, people don't pick up on online surveys. They don't look at the EDC site as you've outlined. I think we need to think of if you're going to consult with neighbouring neighbourhoods, a better way of doing it than you have. Um, we need to approach local groups and organisations to work with them on it um, and not just go blindly into an area. Um, yeah, no, I agree with and, you. And I appreciate you said that in previous years you may have door knocked but there wasn't much evidence of that I was aware of and COVID didn't stop the use of a telephone. Yeah we, we did so the, pre the previous survey did have more like a thousand responses uh, in 2016 and that was because we were allowed to do door knocking the original the original contract which we went out to do this did allow for door knocking as well but obviously during COVID as things kept changing uh, we couldn't do that 
We did put off the survey for a number of times. We, it was meant to be held the previous year, but because of Brexit, we thought that would give an unfair picture of the of the area at the point in time. Obviously, COVID has given a very different perspective of the area at a point in time also. So, so we, you know, we will caveat this survey with it was done during COVID. Um, obviously, people's impressions of the place are very much influenced by what life's been like for them in the past few years. And obviously, we, we acknowledge that the numbers were not ideal, but in the, certain, in the current situation, we would never be aware of when we could have started doing door knocking again to get more. However, our community board, for example, were really, really influential in getting local um, neighbourhoods. And as you say, some of the stakeholder groups have really helped to push the numbers as well. So our community board were really helpful in getting people to respond to it. But as you say, in the current context, we haven't got the ideal number of responses. David, can I bring you in, please? Yeah. And uh, Kevin, my, my question's more around the factual bit of your paper, really, which all looks very interesting, but I'm just wondering how much of this was a surprise to us and how much of it we knew, because all it did for me when I looked through your, your, your sort of your scores on your environment and community and, and economy was it sort of confirmed what we thought the position was. And I, I suppose my question is, how often does one really need to undertake these sort of factual surveys and why are we doing them? Because if it's to help sort of underpin what might be a longer term plan, maybe every two years is too often. Um, if it's to demonstrate progress to other stakeholders, we might not be able to demonstrate progress in a number of these areas over a two year period. So, so I was struggling at a, a little bit, I suppose, with the frequency at which we might go out and, and, and spend money on the factual bit, because I suspect some of our local partners would say, well, I could have told you this anyway. And I'm referring to one particular individual who's not actually on the board today, but would probably say, I, 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 I wouldn't need all of this in front of me to be able to tell you what life was like here in Dartford. Um, and, and so I, I merely raise a question about frequency of going out and obtaining some of this factual information um, relative to how quickly these things move and how often we might really use it to change our direction or our vision. It, that's, that's totally correct, David. So, so we, we were proposing that we would do the resident satisfaction survey and a business survey every two years. So the subjective data would be collect, collated every two years. Um, the objective data would only be available when that objective data is updated. So that's often every five or 10 years. So the, the proposal for the cost would be more in doing a proper um, door to door knocking resident satisfaction survey and business survey every two years. And if there are if there are some of those data elements that do change, that they would be they would be updated almost automatically for us. But we wouldn't be commissioning a full report into the objective data every two years. It would be the subjective data. Which okay, is so, so, so really the cost is around the subjective data and getting that on a wider spread, is it? Then it, yeah, the, the object, it is. Object that is very, very cheap to capture. It's, 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 it's available. It's more how you're just putting it into this framework so that we can see it. So, so the, the framework's giving us a snapshot where we can see these areas at one place at, at the same time, and it can show us how we're comparing to other places. So the benefit to us is, and remembering this is an internal tool, so it's for us to sort of understand how we're comparing to other places, for example, in terms of crime or, um, you know, community benefit, community. I mean, one of the strong things that we wouldn't have got, actually, is the very strong sense of community that's come across from the survey. So, you know, had we not got out and asked people, we know because we run events and we meet people, but for you and for others who are not necessarily meeting people on a regular basis, it's hard for us to, for you to sort of factually see that actually more than 80% of people do think this is a strong community and do want to get involved in events. So in some respects, the value of that to us is to say that people do want to get involved, people do want to meet, people do want to have venues. So it helps us understand that there is a real strong interest in activity. It also gives us a very strong impression that people aren't happy with the environmental issues. They're not happy with the availability of parks, cycleways, walkways. And again, that transpires into our investment. So that's why we're doing a lot of investment in green corridors and city look, parks. Look, 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 look. I mean, all, all I'm... All I'm suggesting is that there may be other channels through which we're getting this feedback which you're which you're you're already referring to all the community events we're holding all the face-to-face -face contact and i just want to make sure we're not replicating that 
um, in order to get the same answer that we could have given without doing it. That, that, that's the only point I'm making. But but you know, I'll be led by by the executive team in, in, in terms of what is necessary. I'm just saying don't go over the top on it. That's all. Yep. All right. Um, I think we've had a good conversation there. Bob, can I bring you in as well? Just, just, just a quick one, Simon, just to say, having read this paper, I was quite happy with it. I mean, I hear what David says, and I think if people are very unhappy, you'll know anyway without doing a survey. Um, but I do think with all the health warnings attached, which I think are important to attach, it's very useful to have this sort of survey at this time in our life, because it's only really now that people are really getting into the area in any numbers as, as the house building's built up. So between now and the next couple of years, and probably in two more years after that, it will be very useful to be able to have a reasonably objective um, analysis to show how the area is changing. And it would be very useful for the organisation, as Kevin says, internally, because we often ask questions and we're often sceptical about some things just to see the numbers that this is producing. It may be there are a whole number of health warnings attached to that, but I do think it's actually quite good value at this stage to get some sort of numbers and some sort of feel. So I'm quite supportive of this. Thank you. Yes, I, I tend to agree, Bob. Um, I think you're right there. Um, so, uh, Kevin, can I just check? This paper is for noting. What are the next steps with this? So, so this is the framework that's been produced for the data collected this year. So we'll be using this as an internal tool. We'll be updating the graphics in it because this was the first attempt at doing that. Um, and you know, there was some difficulty in reading it and others. So we're trying to perfect that, improve that. We'll then start using in the last slide that we showed you to kind of influence our business planning and corporate planning. So where, where there's key areas of concern, we can start trying to prioritize some of those projects. It can be evidence that we can put into our SR and other things as well in terms of what, what some of the needs are locally. Um, and then, as I say, on a biannual basis, then we'll run the resident satisfaction survey and business survey again. All right, thank you very much. So I think we'll, we'll assume that this is duly noted. Thank you to yourself and Miriam for your work on this. Um, so thank you for that. That then brings us on to communications. Mark. Hi, Simon and members of the board. Um, so to mention this month, we wrote a press release following a planning application that was submitted by us to the planning committee for Grove Road in North Fleet. That was used by local TV and radio as well as local media and some trade press as well. In all media containing the name Ebsley Garden City was seen by more than 13 million people during June. Our website continues to perform well with 8,800 individuals visiting our site, which is still good and about 3,000 above average of what we were averaging recently. The blog from our former blogger, which went a bit viral, to be honest, does now seem to have died off a little bit. But the good news is that those people who um, who came from the blog also spent some time looking at other pages as well. So, so we've got that analysis there. And finally, the board video, which, uh, which I think Nick referred to before, was seen by 1,363 people, which isn't a record actually for us, but it is up there as one of the highest. Hopefully we'll start breaking some more records once we return to live filming in the future through Twitter and Facebook. Uh, for new board members, that's how we used to do it. Um, so the meeting was broadcast live, but I guess it's a matter for you, Simon, to be honest, um, not to put you on the spot at all. You're on mute, Simon. Yeah. But if you're live, you can see such errors. Um, so when, when I led a council, we used to have you know, live streaming of, um, of council meetings. So, you know, I think that uh, increases the likelihood of mistakes and so therefore may drive up people watching it. Mm -hmm. um, it was, I tend to find it was mostly spouses trying to work out when you were gonna be home. Uh, but anyway, it's, um, I think we should probably go live as and when. Um, so um, people will be, pregnant with anticipation and excitement with that. Um, so look, um, thank you very much for that, Mark. Any comments on the uh, communication update? No, all right, good work. Uh, that then brings us to design management update. Simon. Good afternoon, board. Uh, so if I could uh, take it as read that, you, that you've, you've read the uh, you've read the report, but just to draw your attention to a couple of key uh, key points, if I may. 
So just to note that the uh, the paper was very much written to provide an overview view of the design management systems that we've developed in EDC over the last three or four years, particularly for the newer board members that may not be familiar, and to also provide a general summary of progress to date uh, and some key areas for improvement. The paper includes 10 action areas that we've highlighted to continue to enhance our design management systems with a particular focus, it should be noted on architectural character, promoting co-design in our in our projects uh, as one of those of our development partners uh, and sustainability and sustainable performance. Um, you'll also note that these design focus areas strongly correlate with the emerging government's agenda on design design quality in the planning system, as well as the priorities of the placemaking team and also the draft outcomes framework that you just uh, discussed. So if I could just pick up a couple of key points. Uh, first one around design guidance. I'm hoping the board have had a chance to visit our Design for EBS Fleet website, which now provides uh, one of the most comprehensive design guides of any planning authority in the country. It means we're very much on the front foot when it comes to the government's current agenda around locally led design guidance. We've already got it there up and running. So uh, and really we, we're really holding up as an exemplar really for the local authorities to, to learn from. Uh, the ongoing work on the Environment Action Plan, though, has identified a need for some further guidance, uh, side, signposting of existing guidance around sustainability and carbon management, which we intend to bring to board as part of the Environment Action Plan work in the autumn. Uh, the second of uh, my three points is around uh, design review. Just to note that the Design Forum was established back in 2019. It's now coming up to having undertaken over uh, just up to 20 reviews actually in the first two years of operation. Um, it's obviously led to a whole range of uh, key changes in, in those projects, but the key design areas that I would suggest it's having an impact upon are sustainable performance and landscape design and the quality of the planting integration of the landscape into our neighborhoods and into our streets. And then the last point I just want to make is around design evaluation. So uh, if Annex 2, provided uh, the board with uh, an overview of the evaluation tools that we're currently using and it also set out kind of uh, a year-on-year -year analysis of, uh, of design performance hopefully so you could see how things have improved over the last three or four years. We're now using a suite of evaluation tools to cover things like urban design, landscape design, sustainable travel and inclusive design. We're working closely with the planners um, to measure, monitor uh, a, very, a broad range of performance criteria within the uh, planning application uh, applications coming forwards. And that allows us to measure and monitor the design performance across developers, the various phases of development and through the years. Um, hopefully you'll be able to note that Annex from Annex 2 that it shows year on year improvements through these tools. Um, and I think that, re that really uh, demonstrates the impact of the design guidance that we've introduced over the last few years and the raising of the bar within the planning applications. Uh, I think it's probably worth noting though that one area that continues to be a, uh, an issue that we need to uh, do further work on is around architectural character. Uh, we do have clear guidance on architectural character and uh, promoting character and distinctiveness, distinctiveness on the design for obsolete guide. But this is an area where house builders are very robust in retaining their standardized house forms, roof forms, and seeking to avoid using materials and details that they're not familiar with, which is challenging the move towards more locally distinctive designs. I would note as a last point that the changes this week in the MPPDF will strengthen our ability to turn down schemes that don't align with our design guidance, and that may provide a greater incentive to, for these developers to do something different going forwards. So uh, just to conclude, I guess it's that time of year when uh, we get school reports home from school. So I would characterize our performance in terms of design as good progress so far, but as always room for improvement. And going forward, CDC and EDC's own delivery projects will provide an opportunity to do some different things and drive quality through things like development briefs and performance criteria, rather than just relying on our non-statutory design guidance. Thank you very much. I'll take questions. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Simon. Neil, can I bring you in, please? Thank you, Simon. Well, but thank you both, Simon. Um, can I first of all um, say, uh, well done. You're ahead of the game in terms of the policy which was advanced in the revisions to the National Planning Policy Framework yesterday on design codes. Um, 
can I just just three uh, things that I'd like to ask about in terms of design? First of all, the architectural character point and appearance that you mentioned. Um, how are you going to make changes to improve uh, guidance on that to make sure developers actually do something? Um, second, car parking. Is there an opportunity to uh, take advantage of level changes to encourage some uh, below surface or if not below surface, partly below surface car parking so you don't have a sea of cars around development? And third, um, what can we do to make sure that public buildings, so buildings funded by the corporation, are exemplary in the way that our Victorian ancestors are sought to achieve with some notable town halls and the like. But here we're looking at schools, community buildings. How do we achieve that? So those are the three issues I'd like to see how we can use our powers and our design codes to achieve. Thank you, Thank Neil. You that, Neil. Uh, Simon. Thank you, Simon. Uh, well, each of those is a pretty meaty subject area in itself, isn't it? But um, in terms of uh, character, architectural character, I think we've took quite a flexible approach in terms of applying the design coding thus far. We've allowed developers to develop their own design narratives and respond to that. And I think that has allowed them uh, to pursue languages and design characters that are much more similar to standardized uh, house building house forms that they've used elsewhere. So I think going forwards, while I, 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 I try and avoid being overly prescriptive and there's a careful balance there, I think we will start to try and be more uh, directive in using the design coding that we've undertaken uh, and moving them towards a stronger alignment with those those codes. We're also uh, in the process of developing some case studies. So we have got some buildings, uh, some fantastic buildings in the pipeline due for, due for construction next couple of years. You know, the school being one of the uh, one of the better ones, for example, but also some houses over in Ashmere by Countryside that do show how you can uh, adopt the approach set out in the design privacy guidance and develop some locally distinctive uh, house types still using established uh, standardised house types, but applying a, a locally distinctive architectural character to them. So using those case studies and uploading those onto the website, we hope to use those to kind of promote a more distinctive architectural character and move away from the, the kind of new London vernacular that we've seen on some of the better some of the better of our projects, I must say, but still not locally distinctive to to Kent, and also the kind of the the, the more typical kind of um, gable-ended kind of house types that we see from the volume house builders across the country. So um, that's that's probably that's I asked some key points around character in terms of car parking. Actually, we have made significant progress on car parking over the last couple of years. So it was only a couple of years ago we got our first podium car park within the Garden City, a momentous occasion, some might say, um, over in Castle Hill. And now we're seeing pretty much most of the apartment blocks, we are able, able to incorporate at least some podium parking, if not all of the parking within a podium or an undercroft um, format. So we are seeing that. And absolutely, there are certain sites within the Garden City, particularly in Eastern Quarry, where the level changes do provide for podium podium parking to be more, uh, more viable uh, and more more actually deliver, uh, deliverable from a spatial point of view. So we have seen a response from the developers on on that, and we shall continue to push and promote that approach. And that's backed up by our sustainable travel strategy that was uh, launched last year that strongly advocates for those parking typologies over and above surface parking for apartment blocks. So that that's helpful. And again, that's strengthening the MPPF, saying that we are more able to refuse uh, projects that don't comply with our local guidance, that is really helpful in, in sending a message back to the developers that what that what we expect uh, for our guidance, we you know we can actually police now through the planning system. Uh, and the last point on public buildings, uh, we actually do have uh, uh, working with uh, Kevin and the placemaking team, we have we have developed a, a set of performance criteria four public buildings uh, that we are using that covers a whole range of different design areas such as inclusive design, uh, sustainability, landscape design outside 
And so we're using using that set of performance criteria for all of our public buildings uh, and uh, perhaps happy to share that perhaps with the board in order to give them an understanding around what it is we're focusing on for our community buildings going forwards. Simon, thank you very much for that. Daniel, can I bring you in, please? Uh, yeah. Uh, very good to see this um, and um, uh, very important that we do design uh, um, properly. A um, couple of points. Um, as for the house typology, um, I, I think we're in danger of having too much of um, a simple local palette of sort of gable ends and oast houses and things like that. And it's all very Kent. Um, I'd like to think that we could have a broader um, palette of, of, of um, house design in particular as we come to review the design review. And my second point uh, was that we haven't mentioned self-build. Uh, we haven't done any self-build. We've done some custom build, but we haven't done any self-build. We do have um, an ambition to have self-build um, in the uh, Garden City. Um, I would hope that the design guidance would be much less prescriptive in regard to self-build so that we could get some genuine, you know, people could actually design houses themselves without having to read off a thousand different bits of design code. And then let's see what happens, because if people are going to build their own house, on the whole, they're going to build something rather good. If left to themselves, chances are much more likely that they'll do something good than something really awful. OK, thank you, uh, Daniel. I take those points on board fully. Uh, I think the, the four design languages within, within the Design for Estate Guide do set out a range of different architectural characters, uh, and they don't just promote the uh, the kind of the, the gable end no, Kentish. We might, we might have five or six instead of four when we come to look at it. I'll happily look at that and see if we can promote some case studies and examples of alternative approaches that still still take a, a local design narrative, but do it in a different uh, language, shall we say? So happy to look at that. we could move away from the local design language a little bit, which is what I was suggesting. But anyway, carry on. No, I'll certainly look at that and we can update the, uh, the website to include those examples. Um, and then in terms of self build. Yeah, absolutely. I'm comfortable with the idea. And I think the developers on the custom build were pleasantly surprised by how hands off we were prepared to be as a planning authority in terms of the design specification uh, and, and how those custom build homes uh, were arranged and organized on the street. So if anything, it was a de uh, the developer that wanted more control uh, over what the uh, what the home, the prospective homeowners were going to do with the cladding, et cetera, and the design choices. But um, yeah, as and when we uh, we bring forward some self build, we'll certainly take that point on board. And uh, obviously, we're we're working within the housing strategy that Kevin brought to board, I think a few months ago now, that does promote custom uh, build in the first instance. But self build is noted as one of the uh, the missing house types that we're keen to support within the Garden City. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you, Simon. John, can I bring you in and then Nick? I think I'm very interested in the uh, design guide. I've just gone through it, funnily enough, I've also just seen it talking about going through in detail. Um, work you've done on it is really good. Um, some of the comparisons and areas you've highlighted are far from the traditional gable ended structure. Now, I must admit, getting involved with design work locally and their own planning committee. Um, I think there's a lot of good stuff you've done there that I'd, I'd like a Gratian to share in. Um, and I think we can complement a lot of what you're doing the same way, same manner. But I think on the issue of copying the local buildings um, has been a potential problem. I, I don't see that. Um, if you actually go around uh, Darford and Gratian, the range of designs are huge. Um, both traditional stuff going back to 16th century, 18th century, right through to some would say a very modern attractive buildings um, others would tend to disagree um, and I think the opportunity to find the right style from Ebsley um, and make it its own place is very much there um, using a lot of the local vernacular without any problem of just boring design because I think your brochure actually highlights the range of opportunities people will have and there are enormous 
my only, it's not a criticism, my only question is, is there another design guide coming? Um, I suppose I need to ask in that. This is very much aimed at housing. I know we talk a lot about housing. I know we're going to have a lot of housing. We, the local people know we've got a lot of housing coming. But there doesn't seem to be much in the way of guidance of how you do um, community buildings or what, what you're doing in the way of shops or offices and the sheds going up. What sort of design features or how do we see the, the space around those being designed as well? And that's missing in the design guide. We can be expecting a lot of jobs being created, the central area being created. We need some sort of guide to developers to say that what we're looking for in this area is to complement what we're building and the local area, but also challenging and modern for the future. So we're sort of a modern way forward, showing how you can do build something. But I think we need a guide to sort of point in the direction. Personally, I love glass and steel. Others want brickwork and um, thatched roofs. Um, somewhere between all that, you need to come up the guide to sort of lead the, the journey forward, so to speak. Thanks, John. Um, just to quickly, uh, yeah, come back on that and, and note note the comments you've made there. Um, appreciate the feedback on the the general design guidance and one of the key actions for the next 12, 18 months, because we were ahead of the game slightly and having already done a lot of this local design guide work is to work with uh, yourselves and, and Dartford to support you know the, the local design guides and the two two boroughs there, and to make sure that we integrate and align with uh, the work that you develop yourselves. So uh, that's a key action area for us uh, to support you going forwards. In terms of um, the guidance on uh, other building typologies other than housing, I guess the position we've taken, and I'm happy to review this, but the position we've taken is that we have other opportunities to influence the design of those types of buildings. So the uh, the community buildings. We're instrumental in, in de delivering almost all of those community buildings in one way or another, and that provides us uh, a different seat at the table and a different way of influencing design, design quality through development briefs, performance criteria, which I, I flagged earlier. Um, and that's the same for the, the central area. Working with Jen and the master plan team, we're keen to uh, work out how we can embed the design quality into the outline planning permission for that. Uh, to to give both direction but also flexibility as well so that we uh, we we are we focused on what is important in terms of design quality uh within the central area but we also preserve flexibility for for those areas that need it within the, the design and the master planning of those, those areas so happy to to review that position but that's the that's where we're at at this point in time nick i'll just can I come bring back you on please simon uh, can come back briefly yes I, of course John. yes i, I would very much I think I appreciate seeing a card even if it's a much briefer one for the commercial elements okay. um, because I think that that is potential an area where good quality design can come we can actually look at futures for our okay thank you thank you John that's noted we'll have a look at that Nick can I bring you in please uh, thank you um, so very good report thank you very much um, the my 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 only carp is um, the <clears> that <throat> uh, uh, reports that are reports that are submitted which are to be noted um, uh, always uh, sort of uh, um, I, I I have a sort of instinctive negative uh, comment uh, negative thought about um, because if it's if it's merely to note I'm not quite sure why it's coming to book no it's it's just telling us what you're doing um, but actually I think some of this deserves um, a longer time for the board to discuss um, and to contribute to um, uh, as as we you know move faster forward into the sort of the creation of the garden. Um, city. So that's that's my my negative point. But it, the, the 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 negative is just that I think that we should spend more time talking about it and engaging on the process. Um, absolutely, I agree. Particularly about offices, this is going to become increasingly important. Um, my positive thought is that the NPPF um, uh, arrangement hopefully will allow us to be more assertive uh, with regards to um, design and for all of our historic planning consents, which has always been an issue. Uh, will that allow us now, and this is me learning, uh, to be more assertive with regards to imposing sort of part L um, 
you know, net carbon enabled uh, space uh, to put more pressure on our developers to adopt air source or ground source. Um, but also to you know, um, approach public realm in a way that will be sustainable for our citizens um, <clears throat> uh, such that we can start thinking about is state service charges uh, in a proactive um, way. Um, and then uh, my thought for the week um, is in particular as we move into an EV charging world, and I'm learning a lot, um, that estates and car parks and similar that we are, which, which propose um, a, um, AC charging um, is something that we need to have a policy on because there is no point in having car parks with AC charging or, um, and similar because <laughs> in the in the 20 minutes or the 30 minutes they're in the car park, um, they're, they're only going to get about five minutes of juice. Um, and uh, and actually we need to start imposing on our estate deliverers, the house builders, uh, the costs of putting in community DC charging so that people can literally park up, get the juice and move on uh, quickly, particularly as we come into a sort of a retail scenario and we start building car parks ourselves, which is going to be quite quickly, uh, imposing DC um, solutions and making sure we've got the right amount of power is going to be in, uh, very important. So not entirely on the point, and I'm not quite sure how you respond, Simon. <laughs> Well, all I can, uh, the way I can respond is to say that a lot of this is a uh, work in progress. We're working on it at the moment as part of the Environment Action Plan. And so a lot of those points you raised around Part L, how we can push harder on performance criteria around that, I think we will address directly through the Action Plan paper coming to you in autumn um, and, and, and a particular focus on performance criteria for our own projects that, that will sit as one of the key actions within that that we want to uh, go through in some detail with you at, at that time. So cool. and in terms, in terms of the vehicle charging, our minimum actually is a seven kilowatt charging facility. So that's somewhere in between the two uh, performances that you just outlined. So it's, uh, it's, it's more than the trickle, but it's not quite rapid, basically, is how I would characterize it. But that's the minimum we expect on plot parking. Thank you. All right, we've had a good discussion there. Um, clearly design, particularly, you know, with the emphasis on building beautiful places and the announcement by uh, the department yesterday is very important to us as an exemplar, you know, Garden City. So thank you very much, Simon, for all the work you're doing here. Uh, let's try and uh, create a beautiful place um, which works for our residents. Um, so thank you very much for all of that. That then brings us on to the next report which is Planning and Housing Delivery Report. Mark. Uh, hi, thank you, Simon. Uh, yes, yeah, so just a few updates um, from, from, from the paper. Um, so yes, this is the board will see obviously in section two, there's the usual update on planning committee. I suppose I just wanted to reflect on, on those two particular cases that are gonna go um, for consideration this evening. We, you know, we are, we are really pleased with those cases and it's really interesting, um, you know, Simon's, uh, Simon's update and report to you there. Um, and I, I, but I think that, that in a way, for me, the thing that I wanted to, you know, to sort of point out, point out, out to the board members was actually the really good collaborative sort of working relationships that, that we've now got with those with, with, with those developers um, through through the pre-application discussions, uh, through, through 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 the design forum, through through the engagement with the committee, and you know, and ultimately that has meant. A particular in the second phase of Ashmere that, that it's actually gone through the planning system probably quicker uh, than some other cases are at the moment. So, so, so just a little bit of feedback for you guys in terms of sort of ways way, uh, of ways of working there. Um, the usual updates uh, sort of um, table talks about the items to come. Um, the growth road consultation has finished and there's quite a lot of additional work that's needed. So um, it's unlikely that that's going to be September, but um, we need to confirm uh, with regards to Alcud and South um, and Red Row. So we'll hopefully do that in the next uh, week or so. Um, the development sites update and obviously the, the annex uh, is, is attached. So obviously happy to take um, any, 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 any questions there. Uh, the scoping opinion for Blue Lake uh, we are looking at and we'll probably have a decision issued in the next couple of weeks uh, for that. Um, on the on London Resort and LRCH, there hasn't been too much engagement from a planning side 
um, with the developers, but we are doing a lot of work with Dartford and Kent around the requirements and around the heads of terms. Uh, we've also had some really good conversations with Gratian about formalising some, some uh, joint work uh, with that. So, so that's definitely moving in the right direction. And in terms of the in terms of the dashboard and the numbers, um, I explained in, in, in paragraph 5.1 why the dashboard looks a little bit different. I was happy to take obviously any 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 questions on that, but yeah, we're at 179 completions for for the year uh, so far. And just to give you an idea, obviously I appreciate that we are we are we are, are, are meeting in August. So over the summer, we're expecting the the detailed applications in for the two community buildings at SV Green, the first uh, phase of the market centre in Alcadon, and we're also hoping to do a bit of a walking tour with the planning committee around Northfleet. So trying to find um, a good good weather day for that. Um, but that's it for me. Happy to take any questions. Mark, thank you very much for that. Um, Neil, can I bring you in, please? Thank you. Um, just two things I wanted to raise. Um, on the dashboard, you've got um, top risks to delivery, and there are three items in red, which are, so it's build cost rising, supply of labour on site, supply chains for materials. And we're doing pretty well on delivery so far in terms of the KPI for the year, the target. Um, so one question is, how should we be concerned? Well, obviously you think we should because you've marked them red, but how, how do you think these issues are going to affect completions over the year? And then there was another slightly different question, but I'll ask it now. There's a slightly, what I might describe as a Delphic um, reference to Barclay uh, and their factory, and that's on page 94 of the papers. EDC reviewing response from Barclay following planning compliance check and landscape audit. Well, that um, conjures up all sorts of things. So can you just put our minds at rest on that? I mean, I, I don't know what that means. OK, happy to do that. Um, yes. Yeah, so in terms of the in terms of the risk, I suppose, because those items have been consistently flagged by the developers as as potential problems, it sort of felt as though it was right to be able to uh, to, to to be marking those in, in, in that way. Um, the different developers are responding to that in different ways. We had a good, good conversation, for example, with Taylor Wimpy, where they were identifying that, uh, that as an issue, but explaining that they were then looking at, at different sources for some of their materials. Uh, that was then uh, leading to increased uh, build costs because some of those that had to come from, 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 from greater distances. Um, at the moment, they aren't translating then into a change of the housing number. The developer forecast is still quite above the 525 for the business plan. Um, when we set the 525 for the business plan, I think that's around around March time. Since then, keep mode delivered their scheme uh, quicker. Telewimpy are also looking to deliver one one phase, um, hope, hopefully earlier as well. So 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 I, I think it, it is a general uh, problem, which is why I wanted to flag it. But at the moment, the developers aren't necessarily translating it into numbers. But but we need to do a bit more of interrogation around that probably when we get to the mid year point in October. Um, in terms of in terms of Barclay, what we that isn't particularly uh, picking on Barclay. We do we do a planning compliance check on every on every consented phase. Um, and uh, in terms of Barclay, um, the check was done. As I recall, everything was okay apart from some elements of landscaping, and that's because some species had died. And therefore, um, um, my compliance monitoring officer and Emma, who works in in uh, Simon's team, has then been talking to Barclay about replacement species to be able to then get more appropriate planting, which would then have some longevity. But we do generally go around all of the sites and check on everyone. So well, that's reassuring. Thank okay. you. Bob, can I bring you in? Thank you, Simon. I've just got a comment and a question. The, the comment is in para two one. I'm delighted to see that uh, the Alcadon custom build developers had good interest in the scheme and it's I'm not commenting on the scheme itself, but just uh, if that is true and there is strong commercial interest in the custom build, uh, hopefully we can attract more custom build uh, operators to to our area, which would give us more variety to offer in terms of the house building offer. So that was very uh, pleasing to read that. Then it's a question to Mark on para 5.2. You said you haven't had a return from uh, Keep mode. At, um, so, does the 179 completions not include Cable Wharf? It includes Cable Wharf 
from uh, last month. We just didn't get a return this month from from keep mode. So 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 they have delivered um, quite a lot already. And actually, I think a lot of a, a large proportion of the one seven nine is actually from Cable Wharf, but we just haven't had that from 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 this month. So yeah, it's only um, um, so Craylins Lane uh, and Cable Wharf are the two sites that we didn't get any feedback from, but just from the last month. Bob. And what what proportion of Cable Wharf is built out now? Then is is Ooh, about that, that's a question and a half. Um, I, they are about um, I think about a hundred units in, maybe just over a hundred. And it is a fairly big proportion of this of the delivery this year, isn't it? That that scheme because of the speed it's moving at. Um, yeah. Originally, originally it wasn't a massive proportion, but it is now potentially going going to be more because they brought one of their one of one of one one of their phases forward. But the general assumptions, I think, to, to get to the five two five were relatively evenly split um, across across the different site. Red Rail always performed very well at ASV Green, so there would have been a high number there. Um, Forty six units would come out of the Newcrest scheme at, at, at Castle Hill. Uh, local centre. There's completions at Craylands, Ashmere Phase One, at Taylor Wimpy. So they are they are they are they are relatively uh, well spread out. Okay, thank you. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Look, thank you very much for the update and all of that, Mark. Good progress. Um, so it's good to know that. Uh, then can we move on to the investment plan update, Julia, please? Sure. Um, so thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, in terms of the investment plan, I'll take the papers read and just pull out a, a couple of highlights. In terms of capital expenditure, um, we are on plan. Um, we, we did have fairly low levels of expenditure through the first quarter um, and, and then it increases um, into the last three quarters of the year. So um, as far as I'm concerned, we're, we're on target for what we should be doing um, in that area. In terms of um, the program update, um, just on para 2.2, since I wrote the paper two weeks ago, um, uh, we've now got the works um, restarted for the cycle facilities to go in at Ebsley International. Um, so that's good that we've got the last scheme which was held because of COVID. Um, and we know that the HS1 team are back on board and at Ebsley International, which is good to see as well. Um, uh, as we've just been speaking about in paragraph 2.3, um, to be honest, uh, again, since um, we've written this paper, um, the, there's been further movement in terms of risk. I would say now that um, for future projects at the moment, the construction level risk um, is one thing that I, I would say is probably at the highest of our table. Um, we've got our plan of action, which we're already working on project by project to review it, to give everyone a feel. The price increase range um, at the moment is anywhere from five to 20 percent, steel being at the upper end of that um, in the 20 percent range. Um, so we are actively working project by project of those which are which could be affected um, in terms of our contingency at the moment. Those price increases um, were what we would expect within our risk budget. Um, any price increases above that, um, we will be looking at how much of a risk that poses project by project as well. So I just wanted to flag that to say that we're working through the mitigations, as I say, um, for those projects which we do think are affected and we will be looking at it as a forward piece. Um, the, I, I would say the positive thing for me at the moment, unlike other areas of the country, we are not seeing significant concrete or mortar rationing um, or rationing to a certain extent. So that, that is occurring in other parts of the country. So that affects both the kind of almost our developers and ourselves. Um, on that. So I just really wanted to flag that, that, that we are now working actively on that to make sure that we mitigate a, a, as far as we can. Um, uh, to be honest, everything is really as read in terms of the projects. Um, the, the, the main thing is a decision which is in the second part of the report, Annex A, which um, we've had two sessions with the infrastructure panel, um, reviewing the terms of reference. We had the first one commenting and the second one to bring back the final version. So we are asking board to formally approve that terms of reference following the review. 
Julia, thank you very much for that. Thank you for the hard work for you and the team. Uh, so we have a uh, board in front of us. Are there any questions? I'm going to assume that we will be OK with the terms of reference for the infrastructure panel. Um, but any comments on, on this paper, please? You have stunned us with your efficiency there, Julia. Uh, so that's uh, that's fantastic. You got off lightly there. So subject to our approval of the terms of reference, uh, that's it. Nick, you've come in with a, a late uh, entry. I, I, you, you, I was just trying to lower my hand, but um, or <laughs> so yeah, because I was merely going to um, uh, really just uh, agree vis-a-vis um, -vis, you know the the issue about the uh, materials. Um, I'm interested in your view, Julia. I mean, we're sort of hoping, and uh, we're the business I uh, are part of the group. One of the, the part, the group of, um, you know, is is a contractor, and uh, you know, we are hoping that we're sort of this is a this is an 18 month occurrence, and that prices will resettle. I mean, we're definitely seeing 17 percent in concrete and steel. Yeah. And we do think that there will be a lot of failures from smaller contractors who have committed to prices and haven't haven't secured all their materials. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it because it will be very it will be very it, it, it must be having a devastating impact. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, we a couple of our contractors are going to do sessions. They've done a lot of research into what they think the market's going to do. Quite happy to share that with you, Nick. Um, yeah, I'm interested. I mean, it, you know, because we're part of our, part of the sort of the Homes England yeah. and MHCLG is for us to all encourage SMEs. Um, but yeah. there is going to be, there is going to be um, a lot of damage in the SME contracting market over the next you know, two years. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's creating quite different pricing reactions in the market so that's creating its own issues in terms of the difference between the first contractor and the second contractor in any bidding process um so i guess that so, that's the first thing for us um are you seeing as a consequence that there is a uh, increase in margin that has been sought for by on on pricing or is it actually just the generic um constituents not, of the pricing that's changing yeah it's not it, we're not seeing any increase in margin um and, and we're checking that all the way through to just make sure that that's not occurring it's generic across the board and it's really about supply so um whilst everyone was talking about covid it's covid internationally obviously we've got some effect from brexit and the ports the other issue, um, if you remember the boat stuck in the Suez, that has adversely affect the smoothness of supply coming through as well. Um, uh, so that that as well is rippling through. Um, so yeah, it's quite a complex situation, but I, I appreciate uh, probably- And add, uh, add to that can... driver shortages as well on the logistic yeah. front. It's, 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 <laughs> yeah, right got... across, it's right across yeah. the piece. It's a little bit of a perfect storm at the moment. So to be honest, from my point of view, it's um, once we've worked it through, it's going to be about how we mitigate that risk. And I think um, as many heads as possible to talk about it and just work it through with us would be appreciated. So, um, yeah, so that, I, I think that's probably where we are, Nick. But I certainly share the intelligence we get. So. Thank you. Nick, good point, Julia. Thank you for that. Um, so I think subject, to, as I say, the uh, adoption of the revised terms of reference, new terms of reference, that report is duly noted, which then brings us on to finance and operations report. Gerard. Uh, hello again. Uh, just a few things to highlight. Uh, we are predicting full spend, including the use of our receipts on the revenue and the details are attached at Annex A. Julia's already mentioned about the capital spend. Um, we've got 16 million plus receipts to spend on that. And the final section in section four oh, talks about our staffing and the recruitment process, which is we've had a number of recruitments that, that are underway or have been completed and they're all progressing well. So any questions? Any questions board that appears to be steady as we go? 
No, I think we're going to assume that that is uh, duly noted there, Gerard. Thank you very much for that. That then, I believe, brings us to uh, towards the end of our part one part of the meeting. There were, as always, um, always fascinating to see a series of public questions which were posed to us where written responses will be uh, published on our website after this board meeting. Thank you to those who uh, continue to ask those questions. It's, um, you know, we like to receive those, ask away and we will respond, try and create a very transparent environment around everything that's going on in the Development Corporation. Uh, so that brings us to the end of the meeting. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, let's stop recording. <laughs>